Welcome. I'm Warno Deschalette, and this is A Baha'i Perspective. Welcome to A Baha'i Perspective. I recorded an interview with Grant Hendon Miller on January 4, 2021. Grant is a former teacher, scriptwriter, novelist, poet, and singer-songwriter. He's produced six albums of music and the scripts for three feature films. Two of the feature films were wartime stories. He also wrote a Depression-era odd couple tale called Starlight Hotel, based on his own novel, The Dreammonger. In this interview, we're featuring Grant's music. I started the interview by asking Grant where he grew up and what was religious life like growing up. Well, I um, grew up in Auckland, which is the largest city in New Zealand. If you look at a map of New Zealand, you'll see that there are two main islands, and Auckland is in the north of the North Island. It's the largest city. I grew up in Auckland. New Zealand is... um, Unlike America, New Zealand is not a particularly religious nation. So that in the census, national census of the year 2000, maybe a quarter of the population said they were not religious. But in the 2018 census, half of the population said they had no religious affiliation. So... Mm -hmm. Religious life was not strong when I grew up. And in my own family, my mother had no religion and my father was anti-religious. Describe for us the path that took you from that background to becoming an adherent to the Baha'i faith. I think I've always had a very inquiring mind because I had no experience of religion When I was about 15, 16, 17, I began looking at what it was. When people would ask me when I was about 17 or so, what are you going to do with your life? You know, what are you, meaning what are you going to work at? I found that a very difficult question to answer because what was really affecting me at that time was what is life about? Why are we here? I sort of wanted that answered before looking at the other, the the second part of the question. So, with a couple of friends, I started going to different religious outlets, you know, different churches, different denominations, just to see what was there, you know, to experience what people did. And I looked at Buddhism, read philosophy. If a guru came to town, I'd go and listen to the guru. And a friend of mine, when I was about 20, a friend of mine became a Baha'i. He had been raised as a Catholic, and then he became a Baha'i. He shared the teachings with me, and I thought the teachings were excellent, but I had no sort of experience of God. So intellectually, I thought it was wonderful, but the mystical aspect of it was foreign to me. Anyway, I went away, and I lived in London for a year, and I came back to New Zealand, and my friend turned up again and brought me some books to read, and I read them. They were Baha'i books. And they made a lot of sense to me. So intellectually, I thought this was a wonderful, wonderful philosophy. I had a dream, actually. (laughs) I had been reading, I don't know if you're familiar with, there's a wonderful book by Jung, Carl Jung, about, it's his um, memoir, something like Dreams, Reflection, Memory, something like that. In it, he talks a lot about dreams, and some of the things, some of the symbols he talked about in dreams, I had a very powerful dream, which had Baha'is in it. And that was a sort of an impetus for me to look at it again more seriously. I reached the point where I thought, well, I, I will I will try this. And I did. That, I was 22. So when you tried it, yeah. what was your experience? It was variable because, you know, like people prayed, and I had had no experience whatsoever of praying. So that was a little bit of a challenge for me. I felt a little uncomfortable with it. But one thing that really helped me was um, 
around that time, there were two guys became Baha'is. One of them was a, a kind of a really tough, kind of a big, tough musician. And, and he had a friend who had had a criminal background, and he became a Baha'i. And these were very manly men. <laughs> so, you know, we'd be sitting having a cup of coffee together, and one of them would say, let's say a prayer. And he was entirely comfortable with the whole process, and he'd pull out the prayer book, and he'd stamp his feet down in a very kind of manly way, and he would say a prayer as if it was a, you know, the most natural thing in the world to do. That was very helpful to me because um, – I could see that, you know, yeah, you could say prayers and it was okay to do that. So um, that, that was very helpful to me. And just over time, uh, the other thing that happened to me is that in Baha'i administration, there is a, an administrative kind of committee called a local spiritual assembly. And in the area in which I was living, I was the sort of the ninth person who could form, because you need nine adults to form one of these committees. So I went to this meeting where where they were going to form the first local spiritual assembly of this area. I was elected chairman. And it was at a time when I was really, I had one foot in and one foot out. And when I was elected chairman, I I thought, gosh, I'm going to have to either find out what this really is or walk away. So I found out what it was and I stayed in and I've been in ever since. So... You're a writer, and you're a musician, and you're also a poet. When did writing and writing poetry and singing become present in your life? From a very early age, I responded really strongly to music, and my father played the piano. He was a little bit of a honky-tonk piano player. In my childhood, he would play most nights. After work, he would, it was 7 or 8 o'clock at night, he would sit down at the piano and I'd be in the lounge with him and he'd be playing sort of show tunes from the 1930s and 40s and it was quite a transcendent experience for me because when he would play, he would sing along and the lyrics of the songs would transport me to the landscape of or whatever was being sung. For example, he sang a song called Ebb Tide. The words go, the first words go... First the tide rushes in, plants a kiss on the shore, then rolls out to sea, and the sea is very still once more. And he would sing something like that, and I would feel wind on my face, and I would actually be transported to that beach landscape of which he was singing, and and that happened all the time to me. And I would also follow the melody. I would follow the melody line and the structure of the song, so listening to my father play and sing was really my musical training. And then when did you start and, picking up the instrument? Or uh... well, Okay, so when I was about nine, about nine or ten, I asked if I could have a guitar for my birthday, and I was given a ukulele. My father's music sheets, the piano sheets, would have little ukulele diagrams of ukulele chords on top of them. I taught myself how to play the ukulele, And then when he was playing his songs, I would sit beside him and I would start strumming the chords as he played, which he liked. He he enjoyed that and he encouraged me. So I I played the ukulele for a couple of years like that. And then I bought my own guitar when I was about 16 and I taught myself how to play. I've never had formal musical training. And what about your writing? Again, I've always been interested in the written word, you know, like at primary school. I don't know if you, I suppose you call it elementary school. My writing often gained attention, you know, positive attention from teachers and student teachers who would come and take it away and take it back to the training college. And I've always just had a great love for poetry, prose and music. Yep, they've always been a very central part of my life. And you wrote scripts for three feature films. Can you tell us about those? I trained to be a teacher. I'm going to go back one step before the films. And I taught, initially taught what you call, I think, middle school. Kids who are 11 or 12. Mm -hmm. We call it intermediate school. I realized that in New Zealand, 
we were exposed to English literature and American literature, but there's very few stories set in New Zealand. We did not have a lot of um, homegrown literature. So I thought I would sit down and I would write a children's novel set in this country. So I did. And I wrote a book, and a novel. It was set during the Depression, because that's a fairly dramatic time. It's called The Dreammonger. And after I had written that and it was published, I took it to a filmmaker and I said, you know, do you think this could make a movie? And he read it, a man called Sam Pillsbury, who was a film director. He thought it could. And together we submitted it to the New Zealand Film Commission, which is a commission in this country to help develop film. They said, yep, we like it. And they said to me, this is in the 1980s. They said, here's 5,000 bucks. You sit down and write a script of this book, which is fascinating because I'd never even seen a film script. I didn't know what it would even look like. At that point, I, I had a Baha'i friend who was a film editor, and his name is Ken Zemke. He's actually an American. And um, I went to see Ken. I said, Ken, can you show me a film script? And he'd been working on a film called Came a Hot Friday. And he said, look, we've just finished this. You can have the script. And so I looked at the script and I said to him, you know, what's I-N-T? And he said, that means interior. What's E-X-T? That means exterior. What does this mean there when it says a beat? And he says, that's a dramatic pause. And then he explained all the kind of little ins and outs of the script to me. And I used that script as my guideline, my map, to write a film script of the book, The Dream Monger. I wrote it very quickly because I knew the story inside and out. And one of the chapters in that book is called Starlight Hotel. And they, the film producer who actually produced the film thought that, that would make a better film title. So the film was made. It was called um, Starlight Hotel. And once I'd written that, the film production company said to me, well, we've got a project here. How about writing a script for this project? And it was a novel called A Soldier's Tale, which was a love story set in Normandy in France during the Second World War. And it starred the Irish actor Gabriel Byrne, a French actress, Marianne Basler, and had Judge Reinhold, an American actor. And so I wrote the script for that. I adapted that book to a script. And the third film that I wrote was called Chanak Beer, which is the name of the highest hill at Gallipoli, which was part of the World War I campaign. During World War I in 1915, England, Australia, New Zealand, and some Newfoundland soldiers, Newfoundland wasn't part of Canada at that time, it was independent, and it, I think it became didn't come part of Canada until about 1949. This disastrous campaign at Gallipoli. At that particular time, because of social structure and social hierarchy, the British officers were from the upper classes, and people who were from the upper classes were automatically made officers, regardless of their experience or their knowledge or their ability. So there were a number of cases where people who were incompetent were in charge of soldiers who were entirely competent, and it wasn't a happy mix. A real incident occurred at the, during the Gallipoli campaign where the New Zealand soldiers were ordered to go over the top of the trenches to, to try and achieve this hill in broad daylight was actually dawn, the sun was coming up, and they would just be mowed down. And the New Zealand officers said refuse to do it because it would just be suicide. And the man who refused to do it and told his men to stand down would have been court martialed. But he said to the English officers, we will take the hill, but we'll do it our own way. It was a very difficult, tense situation. But they did do it their own way, and they did take the hill. 
Unfortunately, they were not reinforced by the English soldiers. There had been a play written by a famous New Zealand writer called Morris Shadbold, and I adapted that as a film. So what we're going to do in this interview, Grant, is feature your songs and play them on the interview. And the first one we're going to feature is Nine Lighted Candles. Why don't you tell us about this one? You know, there is an old saying that the tree of faith is watered by the blood of martyrs. In Baha'i history, that is certainly true. In the early days of the Baha'i faith, and we're talking, you know, it began in 1844, Mm -hmm. a lot of the early believers were being persecuted and being asked to recant their faith, to say that they were not part of this new faith. And one of them was a guy, man called Suleiman Khan. He had played a role in the Baha'i faith. There are two prophet figures. There's a young man called the Bab, which means the gate or the, the door, and Baha'u'llah, from which we take the word Baha'i. And the first of those, the Bab, was um, executed in 1850, and Baha'u'llah sent Suleiman Khan this young believer, to Tabriz, where the Bab had been executed, to try and recover his body after the execution. And he he was able to do that. He achieved that goal. And he came back to Tehran, and he was captured and asked to deny that he was a believer, and he refused to do that. And he was martyred in a spectacularly dramatic manner. And the song is paying homage to him and to, and his act. So this is called Nine Lighted Candles. Yeah, well, because good. he had nine lit candles put into his body. Nine lighted candles, he replied, when they asked him how to die. Let light be my adorner. Men were sent to buy tapers from the market as they tied his hand. Cut right here, he smiled and said, as they pierced his shoulder blade, placed a candle in it, blood flowed like a jet from every slip they entered. They lit every flame They turned you to the square And then around again Oh, Sulema Someone hit a drum They said we must begin Walked you on and on Candles sparked and fled The people clapped and cheered As you held your head up higher Blood streamed from the wind And trailed upon the roadside Like dark jewels Darker still the eyes of those Who watched with calm repose They pushed you in a circle up to the city gate Which they would make an altar for your remains Do Sulema, the candles burnt right down Flames licked in the wounds, the people heard the sound Oh Sulema, they said You think you're so grand Tell us how you feel Show us how to dance And he turned Looked at the street Stumbled once And then Regained his feet He said 
said, all right, all right, I'll dance. And he turned, and he twirled, and he danced, and he lifted both his arms. And he sang to the crowd as they watched him reel around. So we're listening to the music of Grant Hendon Miller, who is a one-time teacher, scriptwriter, novelist, poet, and singer-songwriter. He's produced six albums of music and the scripts for three feature films. Two of them were wartime stories. He also wrote a Depression-era odd couple tale called Starlight Hotel, based on his own novel, The Dreammonger. In this interview, we're featuring Grant's music, and we had just listened to his song, Nine Lighted Candles, about a martyr of the Baha'i faith. Now, Grant, the second song that we're going to feature is Zainab, so maybe you could tell us about this one. Well, like Suleiman Khan, Zainab was one of these early believers. She was a young woman. The believers in her neck of the wood were being persecuted. The men try to defend themselves against the imperial soldiers who were warring on them and she wanted to join and you know fight alongside the men she went and asked if she could that was denied her because she was a woman she went home and decided that she would cut her hair like a man and dress like a man and she went back to the what was really a fort in a place called Sanjan and she fought alongside the men the people who saw her thinking she was a man just thought she was the most valiant and courageous soldier that they had and she fought for five months and whenever she came up (laughs) of the fort on her horse the soldiers were just take flight because they just knew how fierce that this person was and it was a young woman but finally she was executed herself she was shot so this is this song is to um bring her to memory and to you know just to um what an amazing person she was so this is zainab She watched as they fought every day by the fort And she wondered Saw them defend the new revelation Her neighbors, friends and farmers And she bit her hand She walked to the fort, her purpose to join And she waited Jot said a woman should not wield a sword, sent her homeward, sent her homeward to think again. She cut her hair in the style of a man and she nodded, placed on a tunic. The garb of a male moved forward Took up a sword She took up a sword She found a mount and a banner beside in the sunlight Then she made a start like Joan of Arc In the moonlight In the silky moonlight Before the dawn Who is the 
Jesus, one riding out in the sun With a sword heaven bent, held up like a lamp Who is this one angel or demon Crying, ya sahiba zaman Me learn when she was around, they must scatter. When they heard a cry in the day or the night, they would chatter, their teeth would chatter in fear and fright. Who jot and quiet of his bravest of sires as he neared her. The one I told to return That made him She pleaded with him He gave his blessing Who is this one riding out in the sun With a sword heaven bent and cut Like a flame Who is this one angel or demon Crying ya sahiba Zainab, she knew that her time would come soon, though she battled. Resisting sleep, uncaring to eat, she battled. And she rattled the enemy line. Five months she fought against unequal force till they swarmed her. Made her the target of each musket charge They stormed her To destroy her Once and for So we're listening to the music of Grant Hendon Miller, who's a former teacher. He was a script writer, novelist, poet, and he's a singer-songwriter. He's produced six albums of music and the scripts for three feature films. Two of them were wartime stories. He also wrote a Depression-era odd couple tale called Starlight Hotel, based on his own novel, The Dreammonger. So we had just listened to a piece that he wrote honoring the Baha'i historical figure, Zainab. Now, Grant, the next song we're going to feature is called Eduardo. So why don't you tell us about this one? We have listened to two songs now about um, two individuals who gave their life to help establish the Baha'i faith. Even into the 1960s, this sort of persecution has occurred. And Eduardo Duarte Vieira was an African. He was married with children. I guess he had been Catholic. 
and he became a Baha'i. And when he became a Baha'i, this angered the Christian authorities who tried to get him to change back. They asked him or demanded of him not to teach the Baha'i faith. And he remained a Baha'i. He was arrested, he was imprisoned, and he was tortured. And his family could not have access to him except by sending food and a biscuit tin to him. While he was in his cell on his own, he would scratch messages to his family on the bottom of the biscuit tin. And the words of the song you will hear, the first two verses are the actual words he scratched on the bottom of that biscuit tin to his family. And they are the most loving messages of be kind to everyone, love your fellow man, even though he was being tortured and would die in prison. It's Eduardo. Love your fellow man And raise your children with love Love everybody, forgive all The wrongs I have done Be able to face life with naturalness Goodbye And I wish you a long life Duarte Eduardo Duarte Vera Eduardo Duarte Vera The first Baha'i martyr Of Africa Dear children, always be friendly towards All people don't hate anyone Life, it never ends It finishes one cycle, begins another Forgive the wrongs of your father God keep you neath his wings Eduardo Duarte Vera Eduardo Duarte Vera The first Baha'i martyr of Africa Now you'll be looking down on every African nation You'll be cheering on, I know you're doing what you can You had to scratch your words neath a biscuit tin When they threw you in that dark prison If only the whole world could take your message in Eduardo Duarte Vera Eduardo Duarte Vera The first Baha'i martyr of Africa
So we're listening to the music of Grant Hinden Miller, who's a former teacher, scriptwriter, novelist, poet, and singer-songwriter. And we're listening to his songs in this interview. And we had just heard the song Eduardo, which was about a man in Africa, an African, who was persecuted for his faith in a Christian country. The fourth song that we're going to feature, Grant, is called If We Knew. So tell us about this one. I've included this one because my wife likes this song. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you, but I often um, find myself driving a car or if I'm having a shower, I'm reflecting on past scenes from my life and think that, well, I wish I hadn't done that or I wish I hadn't said that or... You know, those kinds of things where you think, where you revisit things you've said and done and you think, well, I could have probably done that a bit better. This song is about, you know, if we only knew that we are a spiritual entity and that what we say and what we do in our lives is important, it's significant. We need to be mindful of what we say and do and we, we need to think about what we're doing and saying because we are a spiritual reality and memory is part of that spiritual reality and we're going to have to confront who we have been we do here in this world but we will also have to confront it I think when we die I think there's a line in the song something like if we knew that what we do may haunt or reward us. It's just sort of like a, a reminder of, you know, we need to be careful about who we are and what we do, I think. <laughs> so this is If We Knew. If we knew we would yearn to do the best we can with each passing moment Know that each of life's offerings To be earned If we knew If we knew At each turn What each step would bring We would prize the soft whispers of the ones who would wish us only good if we knew if we knew from the start how it was we would realize that nothing is lost and I Believe we'd strive Whatever the cost And I believe One by one We'll come home Be together One by one We'll come home where we'll stay There's a star In the dark Waiting for us There's a rose At the close Of the day If we knew what we'll learn At the long journey's end We would make different choices Heed different voices From those we do If we knew If we knew When it's through Stare at the truth It will all Come before us To haunt or reward us The 
things we do if we knew if we knew we're never alone no matter where we are or how far we go there's always one who cares who's near every soul if we only knew one by one we'll come home be together one by one we'll come home where we'll stay there's a star Come home, be together One by one We'll come home Where we'll stay There's a star in the dark Waiting for us There's a rose at the close So we're listening to the music of Grant Hinden Miller, who's a former teacher and scriptwriter and novelist and poet, and uh, we've been featuring songs that he's written. And the last song we just listened to is called If We Knew. And a fifth song that we're going to feature, Grant, is called O Son of Earth. So tell us about this one. In the Baha'i Faith, there are many, many volumes of writings by the founder. The founding prophet is Baha'u'llah. All of the song are from the writings of Baha'u'llah. I think that, you know, like reading writings, sometimes when writings, spiritual writings, are framed in a song, it does, I think, assist those who hear the song to receive and perceive the writings in a new way often or can help us concentrate on what is being said. Baha'u'llah himself said that what he said, that the meaning of what he said is inexhaustible, that each thing he said has 70 and 7 meanings, that it's you can never exhaust the meanings of the spiritual revelation. This particular song, O Son of Earth, when I first started um, trying to write some songs with Baha'i themes or looking at the Baha'i writings and putting them to music, you know, the creative challenge that the writings of the faith, the Baha'i writings, essentially prose, although it's highly poetic prose, and with song, you need to have certain amount of uniformity for the length of a line or the length of a chorus. So it's, a, it's, a, it's always a challenge to find a way of singing something that is essentially prose as a song lyric. And this particular one, I remember I was trying to look at it and suddenly it came very quickly. And I felt a real frisson of um, like spiritual excitement when I put it together. So I, in some way, I felt that this particular track has a bit of spiritual excitement in it that came from outside of myself. So this is O Son of Earth. <laughs> Oh, 
son of earth, wouldst thou have me? Seek none other than me. And wouldst thou gaze upon my beauty? Close thine eyes to the world and all that is therein. For my will and the will of another than me, even as fire and water cannot dwell together in one heart. The Faces of thy servants, that they may behold thee and cleanse their hearts, that they may turn unto the court of thy heavenly favors and recognize him who is the manifestation of thyself and the day spring of thine essence. Verily, thou art the Lord of all worlds. There is no God but thee. The unconstrained, the all subduing, the howler. Him, who is the manifestation of thyself and the day spring of thy essence? Verily, thou art the Lord of all worlds. There is no God but thee, the unconstrained, the all subduing, the howler. So we're listening to the music of Grant Hendon Miller, former teacher, script writer, novelist, poet, and we've been just listening to his music that he writes, and we had just heard the song, O Son of Earth. So the last song we're going to feature, Grant, is uh, For Mercy. So tell us about that one. I'm recording a new album at the moment. I'm almost, I've almost completed it, and two of the songs from that album you have heard during this interview. One was Zainab, which will be on the new album, and one was Eduardo, about Eduardo Duarte Vieira. This track that you're going to play now is also on the new album. I have taken four hidden words. Baha'u'llah revealed a book titled The Hidden Words. The hidden words are gem-like utterances of say four or five lines, some are shorter, some are longer. I've taken four of them and put them in this particular song. They're called the hidden words because the prophet Muhammad had a daughter called Fatima who loved her father greatly. And when he died, she was in such grief that it is said that the angel Gabriel visited her and to comfort her, shared spiritual knowledge with her. But that knowledge was never written down or recorded, and it became to be known as the hidden knowledge of Fatima. Baha'u'llah has said that he has taken the hidden knowledge of Fatima and now revealed it, and it, it, it is in the hidden words. The hidden words is a short compilation, a very, very beautiful spiritual illuminating verses. One very erudite Baha'i man, a man called Mr. Faisi, has said that the hidden words of Baha'u'llah, that little compilation, is in 
embryonic form of the entire Baha'i faith. He said that everything that is in the Baha'i faith is in the hidden words in embryo form. So they're very, very special, and they reward you if you read them and reflect on them seriously and consider them and reconsider them. And so I've taken four of the hidden words and put them together in this track called For Mercy. O oh, son of man, for everything there is a sign, the sign of love. Is fortitude under my decree and patience under my trials? O oh, son of man, the true lover. Yearneth for tribulation, even as doth the rebel for forgiveness and the sinful for mercy. Son of man, the temple of being is my throne, cleanse it of all things that there I may be established and there I may. Abide O son of being Thy heart is my home Sanctify it for My descent Thy spirit is my place of revelation Cleanse it for my manifestation For my manifestation For my manifestation Listening to the music of Grant Hinden Miller, former teacher, scriptwriter, novelist, poet, and we've been listening to his songs in the interview, and we had just listened to a piece entitled For Mercy, which is putting a compilation of what Grant had described as Baha'u'llah's hidden words to music. He took four of those and put them to music. Now, Grant where can people find your novel, your music, and your other works? The novel I don't think you will find because that's now out of print. 
But certainly the films can be found in film libraries and streaming services. You can find the first film I wrote, which is based on my own novel called Starlight Hotel. You can, If you Google that, there's a free copy on YouTube. You can see that. My music is available from Nine Star Media, which is a Baha'i outlet for music. It can be found on Spotify and Amazon and all of the streaming services have all of my songs and the new album, which will be called Pomegranate. And I've called it Pomegranate because that's the national fruit of Persia. Yep, they'll be on Spotify, Amazon and all of the streaming services, or you can get a copy or download from Nine Star Media. Well, Grant, I want to thank you so much for taking this time to share your work with us. Thank you, Warren. It's been delightful to talk with you. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Grant Hendon Miller, scriptwriter, novelist, poet, and singer-songwriter. You can find this interview and other interviews on the website abahaiperspective.com and on the YouTube channel A Baha'i Perspective. For information specifically on the Baha'i faith, you can go to the website baha'i.org or you can call the number 1-800-22-UNITE. I hope you join me next time on a Baha'i Perspective. Uh-huh.